Okay, I'm just going to put this out there. Movie producers do not have the best reputation. It's true. Now, I, you know, I happen to think, though, that movie producing is, in fact, the noblest profession. You know, we get a bit of a bad rap in the media. You've probably seen, you know, episodes or entourage where you see this kind of sleazy archetype of a producer gliding through the scenes. Or maybe you've seen the producers a few too many times. You think that's what we do. You know, it's not really true. You know, producers, well, we look at our projects like they're our babies. We, we coax them along. We nurture them. We dream of this day when we set them out into the world and they do great things. I, uh, I kind of think it's like dropping your, your daughter off on that first day of school. And you really hope the world is a kind place for her. Now, I worked on the uh, original production of the original Ice Age movie. And when that movie opened, we really had no idea if it would work or not. It was a very scary day, but that night, we started getting calls about box office records being broken all over the world. And that day, Baby brought home a gold star from school. <laughs> <laughs> on the other hand, I worked on a movie called Everyone's Hero. And this was a movie about a little boy who goes on this quest to help Babe Ruth and the New York Yankees win the World Series. It was all about perseverance against odds, and it was to be directed by Christopher Reeve. Well, Chris died during pre-production, and then his wife died during production, so the crew was left to finish this movie. We did our best, but when it opened, it barely made a ripple, and it was a really heartbreaking event. I mean, you know, we, we felt we'd let Chris down, and the movie really never found an audience. So, you know, we care, producers care, but does that make us noble? I mean, doctors go out and cure disease. Diplomats toil for world peace. Psychologists try to ease our, our daily burden. What do producers do? Well, that's a good question. Actually, I've been asked that question about a million times. And I'm happy to be able to get the chance to answer it for you and actually kind of talk about how you can be the producers of your own careers and your own lives. So. I would describe a producer as the person who has an idea, and it's an obsession. And a producer doesn't rest and will not let go until that idea finds the form it's destined to take, being, it's a, being a movie or a play or a TV show, whatever it is. Now, of course, you're probably aware that there are multiple producers uh, credited on movies all the time. There's co-producers, executive producers, line producers, associate producers. They can't all be doing the same thing, and actually this is true. In fact, the producing title has been cheapened over the years. It literally is given to people who are the manager of a star, or sometimes it's given to people to just make them walk away. So the Producers Guild of America, of which I've been on the board of, set out to do something to fix that. And I'm really proud to say that they have created something called the Producer's Mark. So I want you, next time you go to the movie theater, to look at the credits and look at the producers and look for those initials, PGA, that follows some producer's name. Because what that means is that those people have been certified by the Producers Guild of having actually done the producing job. So, okay, so what is the job? Well, the best way to answer that is by example. The producers who made the imitation game this year, a good recent example, they were two TV development executives who were looking for a project, looking to figure out what to do. And they ran across an op-ed piece where Gordon Brown, the British Prime Minister, made a public apology for his country's treatment of Alan Turing during World War II. Well, they thought this was a really interesting subject, so they did some research. And they found a biography that was written by him, and they optioned the biography. Then they found a writer friend who actually wrote a terrific screenplay, which they sold then to Warner Brothers. And Warner sat on it for a year, and the option dropped, and so they had to go back out again, and they found another producing partner, and they got the imitation game made after only five years. But 
you know, they made an Oscar-winning movie. And what made them successful as producers was having an idea and then being able to get other people to believe in it. Now, I have an old friend named David Picker. That's him in the middle. He's got, he had some other friends with him in this picture. <laughs> David is a great producer and movie executive, um, and uh, he tells this story from when he was the president of production at Paramount Pictures. You know, every day, producers came into his office to pitch movies. Well, one day, Alan Carr comes in, and Alan Carr had been the producer of the Broadway production of Grease. Big, big hit on Broadway. Sold out for six years. No movie studio wanted to touch it. They just didn't see a movie in it. In fact, David went to see it on Broadway and hated it so much, he walked out after Act One. So when Alan Carr walked into that office, David knew this was going to be a very short meeting. 20 minutes later, Alan walked out, and David had paid $200,000 to make Grease into a movie for Paramount Pictures, <laughs> which turned out to be, by the way, a really good idea because it grossed almost $400 million. But why I bring this up is what David says about this story. He says that Alan was doing what a producer does when he came in. He, David, didn't believe in the project, but David believed in Alan's belief in the project, and that's really what a producer needs to do. Now, when you think about it, movies are the ultimate collaborative art form. It takes a team of artists, and, and it's the producer's job to conjure those artists together and create the scene. It usually begins on the page with the writing. Now, I had the uh, uh, experience of early on being a script analyst for several movie studios, and so I got to read thousands of screenplays and write synopses of them, and I learned a great deal about the craft of screen screenwriting. But, you know, even when you know a lot, sometimes uh, it doesn't help you when you're hiring somebody for your own project. And I was at Disney when I was called to a 7 a.m. meeting with a very unhappy Jeffrey Katzenberg. <laughs> um, Jeffrey had just read the first draft, not the first draft, but one of our drafts of Toy Story, and he did not like the writers that I had hired onto this movie, and he'd scrawled all over the script, no, not funny, I hate these characters. <laughs> so I was, uh, I was pretty desperate to find new writers. And when you work at Disney, you know that Disney pays terribly. So I couldn't find, I couldn't go out and hire an established writer who I knew was really good. No, 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 no. I had to find the young, undiscovered genius who worked cheap. Well, a friend of mine said, well, you should call this guy. He, you know, he just graduated from Wesleyan, and he's really talented, and his name is Joss Whedon. Now, you guys probably know Joss because, you know, the Avengers, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, Firefly, and uh, none of that had happened yet, so all we had was a, a uh, really good writing sample, and we got him hired. Now, you know in animation it takes hundreds of artists to make these movies. You know, 100 artists touch Woody and Buzz to bring them to the screen. But when I tell you that Joss's first pages that he turned in transformed that project and brought those characters to life, that's an understatement. He was just, he did an amazing job. And Jeffrey was happy. And Toy Story became the first animated movie to get an Oscar nomination for Best Original Screenplay. So that was, that was good. So my advice to you as it relates to that story, is always hire a future Oscar winner, <laughs> whatever you can. <laughs> now, you know, you've got your team, you've got your idea, it's time to get going and start production, and production is crazy. And creative leadership is a very different kind of thing than, say, leading a sales team where, you know, you've got objective, uh, objectively measurable goals like a sales target here, the goal that you've got to get your team to work towards exists only in the imagination. Now, uh, I bring this up because I love the story of The Wizard of Oz. And it was a huge project when it started production at, at MGM in 1938, and they handed it to this young producer named Mervyn Leroy. That's, that's him watching the little projector. And 
he was stuck with this project that had a 15-year-old in the lead, a uh, cast of notoriously cranky little people, uh, costumes, music, effects, incredibly, incredibly complicated uh, production. And two weeks into it, he fired the first director. And then there was another director, and another director, and another director. In the end, there were four directors on that movie. But why is it the timeless classic we know? Not because of all those directors. It was because there was a producer on it who had the vision for it and kept that entire team working towards that vision. And I really hope that in your projects, it becomes just as timeless, but maybe they're easier to make. Now, it's okay if you're not yet convinced that movie producing is the most noble profession. I get that. But you know, it's true. You may have heard these studies that laughter actually does good things for the body. And in fact, it does things like lower your blood pressure. And there was a recent study, uh, like in the last few weeks, about how people who experience more awe in their lives actually have lower levels of the hormone that creates inflammation. So, it follows that people who watch uh, The Hangover or uh, The Lego Movie are actually uh, helping save lives. <laughs> or, I'll bet you've studied Bruno Badelheim and you understand how fairy tales, with all their the death and, and abandonment that we read in fairy tales, help prepare the human psyche for the trauma that we experience in real life. And it then follows that, that, that we are mentally more healthy thanks to saw one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and saws, saw seven 3D. <laughs> and, you know, lastly, in a fractious world, movies are one of the last shared audience experiences. And so when a movie like Frozen can circle the world and get translated into hundreds of languages and impart themes of love and forgiveness, I really actually think that makes the world a better place. Now, happily, you don't have to be in Hollywood to be a producer and you don't have to make movies. You can cast yourself as the producer of your own career. Now, as I said earlier, a producer is somebody with an obsessive belief in an idea and follows it and won't let go until it's done. And really, isn't that what we all have to do in our lives to get things done? Think of producing as a leadership framework when the goal that you have in mind isn't a common metric, but something that really can only exist in the imagination. And remember, your ideas can take many forms. You can be starting a restaurant or uh, maybe starting a new business or maybe you have an app an idea for an app, or maybe your goal is to enable somebody else, like a writer or a director, to achieve their creative goals. Or maybe it's your boss's assignment that you're out to do. Whatever that is, learn how to communicate your idea. Start there. Learn to summarize it. Practice your elevator pitch, where in one minute, you need to learn how to create excitement and interest in your ideas. Gather your team. Do a better job maybe than I did in this picture. <laughs> but you know, need, know, need, know, <laughs> know what you need in terms of the skills of your team. If you're doing a restaurant, understand food prep. If you're talking about doing an app, understand what it engineers need to write code. And remember, all of your team members will be talented creatives themselves. Remember that you've got to lead them. You've got to convince them not only that your idea is going to work, but that your ability to lead them is going to work. You need them to all row in the same direction. You need them to all dance around the same campfire. Now, when I look for treasure, I really, really like to have a treasure map. So for your project, have a plan. Movies follow a certain production process. Yours will have its own process. Understand that it's a dynamic process and will always change, so keep your eye on the vision, and that will be your guide. And the day will come when your project is ready and you're kind of 
dropping her off at school for her first day. She'll be okay. And you know what? Even if you think you failed, the story isn't over yet. On Everyone's Hero, I worked with a uh, writer named Mike Reese, who's also one of the writers and producers of The Simpsons. And Mike and I loved that movie and were so sad when it really didn't open and didn't seem to find his audience. Well, a couple years ago, Mike was touring in the remote regions of Iran, and he decided he was going to visit this abandoned monastery on a mountaintop in a cave. And he climbed up there and went back to the cave, and all the way in the back he found an old lady with a wooden plank table, and on that table she was selling two things, rosary beads and DVDs of everyone's hero. <laughs> now, I don't think that baseball is, is a big topic in Iran, but I do think that the story of a little boy persevering against all odds must have made some kids there smile. And to me, that's a pretty noble thing to do. Thank you. <laughs>